The following interview was conducted with Robert uh, F. Stroud, Director Emeritus of Purdue University Airport for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, May 25, 2010, Swaim Instruction Room in the Archives and Special Collections. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Mr. Stroud, and thank you very much. You're more than welcome. I'm happy to do this. Uh, okay, let's start with tell us where and when you were born and early years. Uh, I was born uh, November 25th, 1935, uh, right in the middle of the Depression. And uh, where, where, where were you born? What city? State? I was born Elkhart, Indiana. Okay. Which at that time was the band instrument capital of the world. And uh, everybody in my family ended up in the instrument business except me. I was the black sheep. Uh, my dad worked for uh, Ludwig Leedy, Bishers, and uh, Kahn's, and actually worked uh, at the drum factory when the Purdue drum was built. And uh, it was, uh, he, he would tell about it how long it took them to raise the steer down in Argentina uh, all by itself in an area that had no barbed wire uh, so that they could get a big enough drum head. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and my mother worked in the Consonata Division, which was the Electronic Organ Division. My sister uh, worked at uh, Artley Flutes, uh, and of course, being the, the black sheep, I, I came to Purdue and got into aviation, and uh, entered Purdue in uh, 1953. Let's back up. Tell about grade school and high school, about any activities and things in high well, school. in high school, yeah. yeah. Well, and teachers. Uh, some fantastic. Uh, teachers uh, in the college prep area. Uh, Rex Harvey was a math teacher and uh, he did such a good job that when we got here we were able to skip first semester mathematics. Uh, and uh, Galen Winger who was uh, uh, speech and uh, we had our own uh, little radio program that the high school did for the local radio station. Mm -hmm. And I worked on that. And then uh, I was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, manager, student manager for the football team. Uh, much too small then as I am now to play football. Uh, but I didn't uh, get over five feet until I was a uh, freshman at Purdue. Uh, so I was, was the manager and one of my chief claims to fame was wrapping the ankles of E. Rich Barnes, who was later a halfback here at Purdue and went on to the Cleveland Browns. And uh, yeah, E. Rich had two brothers. Uh, they were stepped a year apart. And so that, that was, those three were interesting to watch as they develop. Sure. And we had the, we had the radio station program uh, we worked on, and uh, I was in, the, of course, the uh, National Forensic League and uh, in the Honor Society. And, and How large and, was the school? Is mm -hmm. it boys and girls? Co-ed? Boys and oh, girls? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. was, yeah, and about how large was it? How large was your class? Our class, as I recall, was about 400. Uh, there was only one high school in El Carter at the time. Would this have been 9 through 12? This had been 19. No, the grades would be 9 through 12. 9 through 12. Uh huh, okay. Yes. Um, the, um, the school, there was only the one high school then. There are two now. Uh, so from three junior highs, they melded into the one high school. And the high school was uh, uh, 9 through 12. So uh, when we went into the ninth grade, we were just one big melting pot. 
and it was interesting, but the, the facilities and, and that at, at Elkhart High were, I think, quite exceptional for that time. And we had excellent uh, faculty. <clears throat> we had uh, classes we could take <clears throat> uh, in the morning before school started. I had a chemistry class, uh, uh, it was chemistry 13, you know, all the classes were named by the grade you were in. And that started at 7 o'clock in the morning. And it was an analytical chemistry class. Uh, consequently, when I got here, oh, again, I was given the option of going into an advanced chemistry, in essence taking freshman chemistry in one semester. Oh, that's so good. we we got an excellent education like at Elkhart, right? And uh, <clears throat> and uh, I, I've always been uh, been proud of what they provided up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, our football teams weren't the greatest. Uh, basketball teams were competitive. <laughs> uh, Basketball's <clears throat> always been strong in the state. <laughs> yes, that's that's true. Yeah, uh, but. Uh, it, it was a good time in high school, and I think out of my graduating class, there were about 15 of us came down here to Purdue. Mm -hmm. Did you come down beforehand, and how did you decide, had you selected Purdue? Well, it, it wasn't so much that we were a sele selecting as, as the high school assigned us. I mean, it was a given fact that were if you were in the science, mathematics area, you were going to go to Purdue. Okay. And if you were in the humanities area, you were going to go to IU. If you wanted to teach, you went to Ball State. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so it wasn't so much that we chose where we were going. <laughs> Uh, these were the only places we heard about. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, but did you come down in advance, though, like maybe the summer? Did they have any? Did you, had you seen the school before you came? I had seen it once because I was down here for a speech contest. Oh, okay. All right. But there was no high school introduction programs at that time. Sure. Okay. The first time I saw the campus was uh, when... In when the fall I came when down. Came, right. Where'd you live when you came? Hall X, which is now Meredith, right. okay. which surprises some people because that was built as a women's hall. Uh, but when it was opened uh, in uh, 54, 53, uh, <clears throat> there there were not enough women to fill a hall. Was it the same size it is now? That's why they called it the X, didn't they? The X, yeah, okay. yes. And, and interestingly, I found out when I got in the Air Force that the X was used by SAC as a practice bomb site. <laughs> by SAC. But, uh, yeah, we got here and in 50, uh, fall of 53. It had opened mid-year, I think, 52. Mm -hmm. uh, so the hall organization, the club Excalibur, was already established, uh, <clears throat> and we melded right in. Uh, we opened the radio station down in the basement, um, and what ha had been assigned as the women's hair washing room was the record library. And the radio station uh, was the only place where women could be in the hall other than the main uh, entrance. Not even in the entrance way? Could well, in, in the main, oh, main okay. entrance they could be I there. See. Okay. Uh, but um, we had an exemption because we also fed our programs to the women's halls. 
later on we connected up with WCCR Carry Hall and became the Purdue Residents Network, uh, sharing time between the two stations. Uh, so that was fun. Mm -hmm. But uh, and that was kind of a carry on from my radio work in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Excalibur. I served on the legislature two years. Uh, junior year, I was secretary of the club, and fourth year, I was public relations director of the club. Uh, so, uh, and became a member of Tomahawk and all that sort of thing that followed. What was the campus like in those days? Was, what, was the, what was the campus like? Just a little about campus life and then, of course, any of your, your course of studies. Campus life, there were about 14,000 of us on campus. Okay. Um, of course, we, we walked from the X all the way from the X down to the campus, <laughs> which doesn't seem very far now. But uh, behind X were the married students' barracks, the veterans. And those barracks also aligned what is now Airport Road. And so we freshmen, uh, when I came in, I was just 17. Uh, we were in classes with 20-something veterans. Sounds who, a little bit like after World War II when the pay came back and there were students, That's right. okay. That's right. And, and these men and women were very serious students. I mean, those of us who came from high school, it was just like we were in the canoe flowing down the river. Right. They were here for a purpose. And they were great competition in the classes. Um, I heard similar things for those who experienced the post-World War II, the young ones and the ones that came back. That's were right. very intense because they had lost a lot of time and they needed to get done and on. That's right. And, uh, but, but they, were, they were so great to work with. Uh, and of course in my field, uh, I was, uh, in the air transportation program, which was part of the aeronautical school. So quite frequently I would see a, a student named Neil Armstrong walking up and down the hallways. Uh, and uh, uh, never, never ran into uh, uh, that electrical engineer, Cernan, uh, but Roger, was in my class, uh, but he was a, a, I believe he was a mechanical engineer. So I, I saw him on campus and knew him, but uh, Armstrong would pass in the hallways all the time. So when they announced the astronauts and they said Armstrong, I could look at the picture and say, there he is, you know. And of course, uh, we, uh, Armstrong and uh, Cernan and I uh, met several other times after they were in the astronaut corps out at the airport. Mm -hmm. uh, the campus, when we came, uh, was a different world than it is now. Uh, the only uh, students allowed to wear uh, denims were the AGs if they were going on the AG school campus. Uh, the women all wore skirts, uh, which was the same in Amelia's time. She was quite different. Uh, <clears throat> the only time they didn't wear skirts was when they were going to their uh, gym class in the women's gym, which is uh, right there at the beginning of the campus by the uh, Elliot Hall, and they were allowed to wear their their blue tank suits. The gym outfits. Were, 
shorts and mm -hmm. blue shirts. Uh, other than that, they, they were to wear skirts. Uh, so, uh, and did you have to wear ties? Blouses. You didn't have to wear a tie to class, though, did you? Did you have to wear a tie, shirt and tie to class? We not? had to wear a tie in the, in the residence hall uh, for evening meal. And, and was that served or buffet? No, or? it was a cafeteria line. Oh, okay, all right. And uh, we had to wear a jacket for Sunday lunch along with the tie. Uh, but you never wore shorts than anything. Uh, so it was, uh, the, the attitude uh, was quite different mm -hmm. on the campus. Then. Sure. But we were comfortable with it. I mean, there was oh, no yeah. problem. A lot of the, um, with a lot of the social activities revolved around the union, as where most of those were held, or did you have some? The union had a lot of social activities. But within the residence halls, whether in the residence, excuse me, with the residence hall organizations, like Excalibur, uh, I would say most of our social activities were related to the residence hall. Uh, okay. X, for example, had its own band. And we had connections in one of the dining rooms. So if the band wanted to, to do a show, we could have them broadcast from the dining room through WRX and WCCR and to the women's Oh, wonderful. Hall. Sounds good. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we had our own uh, dance mm -hmm. band. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when we wanted to have a dance, there it was there. Uh, but other than that, I would say we were involved with activities at the union very little. Uh, we did have one. We had uh, Miss Billsboro. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Uh, she would go around to the residence hall units and teach us dining etiquette. I've heard. And uh, Mary was it Mary Louise or Mary Rose or something like that or Billsboro? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, she was affiliated with the union. Yes. Yeah, right. Oh yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And uh, so. Uh, that was the way uh, life mm -hmm. was on the campus. Okay. What was your um, what school were you enrolled in? What was your major? I was in the aeronautical engineering, okay. the air transportation. Okay. Uh, where that was, where they held, where were your classes held? And primarily would be uh, about fifty-fifty campus oh. and airport. Oh, okay, all right. Because our first two years in our program were essentially aeronautical engineering. But in our option, uh, our last two years were more business oriented. Uh, we still had aviation classes like air cargo and airline operations. And that. But uh, all of a sudden, uh, I found myself with a major in economics as well as. Because of the courses that you were taking. Because uh -huh. of the courses. Sure. We, we had a lot of economics courses. At two years of the law and uh, uh, investments and I don't know what all. Sure. But we, okay. A lot of economics courses. Uh, labor, econ. And yeah. I'm going to stop for a second. For the researchers, these business courses he's talking about, Cranert was not built. That's Cranard correct. Building, so they were held elsewhere on campus, other buildings. Okay. That's right. Our courses uh, uh, were uh, uh, some in Heave Hall, uh, some Hall was under Stanley the recitation Court. building. Okay. Right, right, okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, they keep renaming these buildings. I know, and, right. You know. Right. Um, so uh, that, that was... Uh, did you have to uh, be enrolled? What about ROTC? ROTC was required. However, I was exempted 
because when I was about seven, I developed rheumatic fever and had a heart murmur. Mm -hmm. So I was exempted from ROTC, which gave me the ability to take an extra course every semester. Sure. Right. Okay. So I had a few more electives. Yeah. But ROTC at the time was, was a big program on campus. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it was uh, unusual not to walk across the campus and see a dozen guys in uniform. Uh, we didn't see any women in uniform. I had a good friend of mine uh, uh, in the hall uh, lived next to me who was in Navy ROTC and uh, became a commander of the local of the ROTC uh, student brigade. Subsequently, uh, went in regular duty after graduation, uh, was flying in Korea, and ran into a mountain. So we lost him. Uh, Trell was uh, a soloist in the Glee Club. And if you ever are able to find an old recording that has cool water, you will hear this tenor singing this refrain of it. And that, that was, oh, wow. that, that was Trill. Oh. Uh, his name was Ray Trailer. Uh, we called him Trill or Old Dog Trey, <laughs> <laughs> whichever worked. Yeah. Uh, he was quite a guy. Uh, and at the time, uh, his roommate went into the Marine Officer Corps and uh, he was a big strapping guy. And it, it was funny, he come back from training every summer and said, I'm a Marine, I'm trained to kill. <laughs> you know? I said, boy, they really got to you this summer, Bruce. <laughs> you know? and, I'm and, ready to face yeah, the enemy. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, that's, um, and then after grad, did you serve in the military at all then? You yes. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, after graduation? After graduation. Okay. Uh, we, we had a choice, uh, go find some place to enlist or wait for the draft. Well, I told them I never looked good in brown or green. I looked okay in blue, so I would go for the Air Force. <laughs> and uh, I took the exams uh, and uh, went over to... Uh, uh, Air Base over in Illinois, and took exams, took physicals, uh, passed the, the written, passed uh, three physicals. Uh, I told each of them, I said, I had a heart murmur when I was a kid. They said, you don't have a heart murmur. Very well. I understood that sometimes as you got older, they would go away. So there, I went in the Air Force. I was down at Lackland for training. I went through another physical, and the doctor said, you've got a heart murmur. I said, that's what I was telling him. He says, what do you have? At that time, all officer candidates had to meet the same physical requirements as pilots. You could not be a pilot with a heart murmur. So I was already in the Air Force. They said, you're going to the other side of the base. So I was over in basic training. And I had taken the, the qualification test, and uh, the uh, NCO in charge said, well, you scored high enough. You have any career field you want. Uh, he said, we have to let you have a career field associated with your degree, uh, if possible. He said, that would be a cargo loader. I said, what else is available? What are my options? Yeah. He said, you could go to language school at Syracuse University. I said, that's where I'm going. So then I spent uh, a year at Syracuse University learning Russian. 
and served as a Russian interpreter while I was in the Air Force. And uh, almost two years in Turkey. But uh, it, uh, while it was a disappointment not being able to get a commission and, and fly, uh, it was an interesting time. Sounds like, yeah, I'm sure it was, yeah. Uh, my flight happened to be on duty. We, um, all this is unclassified now. Uh, we intercepted Russian radar transmissions and we used their radar to follow the U-2s. And we were following the U-2 coming out of Pakistan one night and all of a sudden it disappeared from the track. And they always put in a three-digit code along with the, with the bearing distance. And they had just changed the code so we had a choice of we've lost the track or the aircraft is down. And immediately the balloons went up. And we had the capability of getting a message on the desk of the president in 15 minutes. So consequently, we sent a message to Ike and said, sorry, Ike, but it looks like we lost an airplane. Uh, and the Russians confirmed that, of course, with a great deal of pride. And um, so, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't tell Ike whether the pilot survived or not. All we knew was the airplane was down. Well, the pilot survived and the rest of that is history. Uh, but that was one exciting time. Mm -hmm. uh, I say exciting, it was frantic. <laughs> uh, we had another time, I was, uh, I was working as an analyst and one of the men from the uh, Morris Code Division called me over he said, Sarge, I've got some plain text. Because most of it came in the three-digit code. So I went over, and, and he did. It was plain text Russian. And what it said was, and I think my memory is pretty close to accurate on this, the capsule has landed. The... No, it said Leica and the others are okay. It will go to Moscow tomorrow. Well, Leica was the dog. So this was the first recovery of a live subject from space. And of course, we shot that out directly. I had a little problem with the brass at that point because something like this the captain gets on his phone and colonel you gotta come out here well all of a sudden we got two bird colonels a lieutenant colonel and a couple captains and and i'm standing there with the message in my hand and with my four stripes wondering why how why did i say anything and they said this is fantastic we're a bunch of heroes. And I called the colonel, the deputy commander of the group. He was a flying type. The commander of the group was an, an ex-teacher. I felt this was time to talk to a flying type and not a teacher. And I said, Colonel, this was a deliberate feed to us. I said, well, what do you mean? I said it was on a frequency that they usually use just to transmit the coming and going of aircraft, a very nondiscreet frequency. It was sent in plain language 
Russian Morse code. And the operator tells me that the transmitter was a little stronger than normal and the keying was very deliberate. And I said, this does not make sense. If you've got a big event and you want to let your people know, but nobody else, you would do just like the Japanese did in Hawaii and use code words like Tora, 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 instead of we just bombed Pearl Harbor. You know? And I said, another thing is, I had one of my operators get on Radio Moscow immediately. And I said, 10 minutes later, Radio Moscow made the announcement in English. I said, and he said, well, what makes this suspicious? I said, well, we never believe anything the Russians tell us. They tell us they invented the radio, which they call radio. They tell us they invented television, which they call television. They tell us they invented the airplane, which is aeroplane. They tell us they invented the airline, which is aeroflot. Uh, they know that if they just send it out in their own normal use, we're not going to believe it. So they fed it to us for us to intercept. And Colonel said, well, I think you've got a point. And he called over the group commander, talked to him. And the final decision was, uh, no, it wasn't fed to us. We were a bunch of heroes. <laughs> so at that point, I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and so that's the way it went. But it was a very interesting time over in Turkey, and especially when they decided to change governments, uh, not quite the way we do. The armored headquarters was across the Bosporus from Istanbul. And so they, they just came across. And uh, they made an announcement that... Uh, all roads were closed, railroads would not run, aircraft would not fly, and any vehicles caught on the railroad or on the roads, roadways, would be shot by the Air Force. And they in fact did get one deputy minister that way. Hmm. But we the way the things were structured in Turkey, we were on a Turkish base. Uh, the U.S. had no bases in Turkey. All the bases we were on were Turkish bases. Consequently, we had a detachment of Turkish infantry uh, on the base, and they would, one of them would be at the main gate along with a, one of the Air Force Air Policemen. So the poor lieutenant in charge of his Turkish infantry, they've just had a change of government. Are we still on their side or not? So he does the safe thing, and he has his infantry surround our operations building. And we're coming and going to work, walking between them, Hey, how are you? How are you? And they'd wave at us and everything. But he had us surrounded just in case. Yeah, the safe side, yeah. And it took him 24 hours to get orders that said, uh, the U.S. is still our friend. <laughs> and then everybody went back to the barracks. <laughs> so, you know, there were interesting and, and, times. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about um, be what was your career path before you came to Purdue? After, after you got out of the military, is that when you came to... Yes, I got, okay. out, I got out of the Air Force okay. uh, in, in the middle of a recession. Uh, and uh, I was uh, fortunate I read about the change in management at the airport. Uh, it was changing from 
the Purdue Aeronautics Corporation handling the management uh, to Bill Fledemeyer, who was director of service enterprises. And it, it was mentioned somewhere that he really had no aviation experience or background. Uh, so I sent him a letter. And fortunately for me, uh, I told him about my experience at Purdue and everything. He went over and talked to Bill Berner, who was, when I was on campus, was manager of Hall X. Later became in a higher position in residence okay. also. I recognize his name. Yeah. A terrific guy. Mm -hmm. And Bill, f fortunately for me, he said, don't question it, hire him. So I was asked down for an interview, we talked, and he gave me a job as a assistant to the director with the intention that I would be here for maybe two or three years and move on to a larger airport. It would be used sort of as an intern training program. So that's why when I came. Uh, at that time, uh, a good friend down at the Indianapolis airport uh, said, when you're through with your training at Purdue, you got a shop down here. And uh, in the meantime, Bill Fleetmeyer, he never would admit what it was, but I think it was either a stroke or a little heart attack. So I was left there with an airport on my hands and re uh, relying uh, on Lytle Freehafer, who was uh, VP at that time. And uh, we struggled through. And when we got done, at Lytle's suggestion, my title was changed to assistant director. And they asked me to stay, not just as intern. So, you know, that's the beginning of a 19 plus year right. career. Right, okay. Yeah. I'm, one of the quotes is most of my time is dedicated to me and the needs of the community, and it's the second busiest airport. In Indiana, you became the director, airport manager in 1980. Right. right. Okay. Let's right. talk a little bit about that. Some of the things. About becoming the director. Yeah, and what the responsibilities and your challenges and uh, the community, the airport's role, in liaison with the community, both the Purdue and, and the business community. Yeah. Uh, when when Bill Flatemar took over the airport. It began a transition of the airport from the university's airport to the community's airport. At that time, there were two other airports in town, Eretz, just off of 25 northeast of town, and Halsmer uh, in the general area of SIA. Uh, neither of which uh, had the facilities that we did. The big impetus and the change of the airport came in with the development of Empati, which was a Midwest program on airborne television instruction. Right. Uh, a pioneering program. Sure was. Uh, but those DC-6 AB aircraft uh, required uh, a longer runway than what we had. So the first thing they did was build the longer runway, which was 1028. Before that, we had the short one, 523, and a grass strip, uh, which you can still see out there because it had French drains in it. Now, French drains are simply uh, 
ditches filled with gravel. So the water runs in and runs through the gravel and drains the soil. And the Lake Central DC-3s could handle a, a turf runway with no problem. So we had the one paved runway and one grass runway. So then the long runway, 5,200 feet long, to handle the uh, uh, DC-6. And it was, it was tight even for DC-6. Impati was in a, a unique program, broadcasting uh, televised classes to five states, part of Michigan, part of Illinois, part of Wisconsin, part of Kentucky, part of Ohio, as well as all of Indiana. All of Indiana. They flew over Montpelier, Indiana at about 14,000 feet. Uh, it flew a figure eight pattern. Uh, the antenna, which was retractable and came up under the belly of the airplane, when they were in flight, was put down and it was vertical. Uh, and it was on gimbals so that as the airplane would bank to turn, the antenna would stay straight down so it didn't interrupt them. Uh, that operation was very similar to a military operation. They had two aircraft. They had duplicate tapes on both airplanes. And when the one took off, no matter what the weather was, Monday through Thursday, at about 7 o'clock, And there, they got up into their uh, broadcast position and they started their tapes. The tapes were started on the one in the hangar at the same time. So the, the one broadcasting had a problem. The one on the ground could take off and they would go up. They would synchronize their tapes. And I've been told by teachers who were on the ground that there might be a a little flicker on the screen and that's all. And they would continue broadcasting. Now each aircraft carried two days tapes. Uh, so in case they couldn't get back to Lafayette because of the weather, they still had the tapes for the next day and they would fly that next day. If they were flying the next day and it looked like the weather was going to be bad the third day. A station wagon was loaded with a day's tapes and off they went. Sometimes as uh, far as almost Atlanta to get the tapes down there. It was very much like a combat operation. I mean, it was, it was a serious business. It's nice. I'm glad you share that because there are, very, there are not many people. I saw the Dave Moses, of course, was involved when I knew Dave in the Audiovisual Center. He told me a little bit about it, but a lot of people today don't, you know, it doesn't exist, and you had to be around that time, and I, re I remember reading about it originally in the newspaper, and I thought, this is just, this is before I even came to Purdue, you know, so I knew about it even before it came. Yeah. You know, but each, each one of the aircraft had two UHF stations yeah, on it, yeah. and they were broadcasting two, two stations at the same time. Right. Just a breakthrough. The, it's amazing the, uh, that, that they were yeah. able to pull it off. The, uh, the electronic techs were provided by uh, Westinghouse. Uh, the uh, maintenance men on the sixes, since Purdue Airlines people at that time were really DC-3 men still, uh, were provided by an independent company, All-American Aviation. And uh, the pilots were Purdue Airlines pilots. Uh, Jerry Goldman served as chief pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, each pilot 
had his own idiosyncrasies. Of course, there was one of the captains who they said everything is ready to take off, and he would reach in his pocket for his toothpick. The airplane didn't go until he had his toothpick. Yeah. <laughs> Did it run during the school year only and then not during the summer? I'm sorry? Did it run just during the school year? During school year, okay. correct. correct. And then uh, there wouldn't be any um, broadcasting during vacations, just during when classes would be. When well, school was you see, they, they would be broadcasting because oh, okay. when you're dealing with that many states, their vacations are at different times. Under, good point. I understand. So, that clarifies uh, that. So they... Right. Vacations didn't make any difference, sure, right, exactly. except for Christmas Day. Right. Okay. Yeah, maybe Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. Summers were pretty much standard, you know. So. Yeah. Okay. So, well, even within our county, the vacations there. Right. Yeah. Uh, but that was a fascinating program, and uh, those of us at the airport learned quite a bit from it. Uh, we learned we had to change the asphalt mix on the runways because at that time there were no parallel taxiways. They had to come down and make a turn on the runway. Now we're talking about a 106,000 pound airplane pivoting on a wheel. So after every landing, especially in summer, we would go out with the shovels and scoop up that ridge of asphalt that got shoved up. So uh, we learned from it. Uh, our gophers at the airport learned to time the flights pretty well. Um, we call them gophers. There are th 13 striped ground squirrels, of which we had a tremendous population. Uh, because the airport was an ideal environment. At that time, our runway lights had a yellow cone over them, presumably so they'd be easier to see in the daytime. Somebody in Washington finally woke up and figured out if a pilot could see that yellow cone, he could probably see the runway and didn't need the yellow cone. And we were able to get rid of those things. But while we had them, it made an ideal environment for the ground squirrels because they could have their hole come up right under the light, and they had this big rain cover, so their holes never got wet. Uh, the unfortunate part was uh, that we had underground cable, and, and there were a certain amount of electrical leakage out through the, the uh, conduit, and salt would form on the cable. And the ground squirrels loved that salt. And sometimes they would get carried away and eat through the insulation. And we flip on the lights and only half of them will come on. And so then the campus electricians were, would be out there using various techniques to try to find the right. one that was causing the right. problem, the problem right. uh, out, of, out of 110 lights. And uh, so when we uh, redid the runways, our 1972 project, the runway used to end right here. And it was extended. It was widened from 100 to 150 feet. We extended the short runway another 800 feet put in the parallel taxiway so they no longer had to make that turn. And of course, by the time we made all these improvements, uh, which would help uh, the Impati aircraft, they were gone. <laughs> and the program was gone. Uh, but at that time, uh, Purdue Airlines was using DC-6s as transport, as part of their uh, certificate as a uh, non-SCAD carrier. And uh, so they were able to take advantage of that. But when we did this, we put all the runway light cable inside metal tubing to make things a little more difficult for the ground squirrels. 
good point, yeah. Uh, the ground squirrels, however, uh, were a source of enjoyment for our hawks. We had four red tail hawks who considered the airport to be their home. Uh, one would always be positioned out here by the tea hangers, one out here at the southeast corner, one about halfway down the runway, and one at the end of the runway. They each had their own territory. Uh, these hawks were very well behaved. They stayed away from the flight patterns, uh, and they worked the ground squirrel population. We only had one bird impact, uh, and that was a young hawk who hadn't quite learned the procedure yet. Uh, a new kid on the block. <laughs> yeah. We also had a considerable amount of other wildlife. Uh, one muskrat we had who loved the drainage ditches and the culverts under the taxiways misbehaved and came up around the building area and would not move out and so we had to shoot him. We had Fox who got along with us very well. Everything south of the primary runway was Fox territory. The culverts were ideal places for them to have their young uh, they were protected from the weather. Yeah. Only uh, one occasion did we have a problem with a fox. He came up around Hangar 4, and a teller called me, and they said, we've got a fox up here by the hangar. So I got out in the truck, and I went over that direction. He came over and got on this taxiway, ran down the taxiway ahead of me, stopped at the runway, looked both ways, crossed the runway, came over into this area, which was their territory. He sat down. I just drove the truck around him in a circle, and he just sat there and watched me, like, I'm on my side of the runway. <laughs> and, and it was funny about our line crew, who had the assignment every morning when they first came in, to run the runways and taxiways, to check for any debris or anything, and also to check all the runway and taxiway lights. Well, one of the male foxes decided this would look like fun, and they would come out there and they would meet him here, and they would run in the grass alongside the truck as he made that inspection. And when he got back, and went, when they got back and went to the ramp, he went back over to his side of the airport. <laughs> but he would be there every morning, That's just like clockwork. Yeah. Uh, but finally, the activity on the airport reached such a level that it was uncomfortable for them to raise their young there. So then they moved down into the gravel pit. Yeah. The deer, before we extended the runway here, this was farmland. And there's a creek over here that was part of their transit path. And they would come down the creek, cross the farmland, and go down into the gravel pit. We extended the runway right across their walkway. And so we had some issues with the deer. Uh, we would get a call from the tower. We got deer on the runway. We'd go out chase them, just stay behind them, keep them moving, and they got over the fence. We finally had to raise the fence to a 10-foot fence, uh, and recently it was elevated to 14 feet. Uh, but we pretty much directed their path around the end of the runway. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the only issue we had with them. Uh, so by and large, our, our wildlife problems were, were interesting. We had a wildlife expert on the campus who could advise us. And uh, 
we had uh, this particular hangar, hangar four, had big eaves extending over, and we had quite a colony of sparrow hawks that had their nests up there, but they were never a problem. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the birds were not a problem. The deer were not a problem. And the fox, of course, were too smart to be a problem to anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the wildlife issue was, was interesting. Yeah, I think so, right. <clears throat> what are some of the uh, things that you did when you made changes when you first took over? Talk a little about that. And then I thought we'd talk a little bit about the... Yeah, airlines. when we took over in yeah. 1961, when I came in. Well, first of all, uh, we took over all refueling activities. We took over the bulk farms, uh, the trucks for fueling the aircraft. Uh, hired a crew, trained them in fueling aircraft, trained them in the, the issues regarding the safety of the fuel, keeping it clean and all this. And the real change came when we got into the jet area with the jet fuel, uh, which is essentially kerosene, uh, but very pure. Aviation gasolines were colored. The 8087 was red, the 9196 was brown, and the 100, 115 was purple. You could get a glass of gasoline, tell which grade it was. The jet fuel was clear as water, and, uh, and it had to be. The nozzles on the jet aircraft were very small. Jet fuel itself, we could have a bowl of it here, and I could take a match and drop it on the jet fuel, and it would not burn. The jet fuel had to be vaporized. It was kind of discouraging when the we had to drain the filters on the jet fuel farm every morning to make sure there was no sediment or anything. The fuel that we drained out into a, a white bucket went into a 55-gallon drum, which the fire department would pick up when they wanted to run a practice fire. And they would put it out in their fire pit. And the first few times it was funny to watch them. They'd take a railroad flare and they'd go up and they'd, and they'd touch it. Nothing happened. And they'd touch it again and nothing happened. And they'd drag it through the jet fuel and nothing would happen. Well, those of us who knew uh, were being very entertained by this. Uh, but finally, we took a five-gallon tank of gasoline and poured it on top of the jet fuel, and they lit that. Now, once the heat from the gasoline fire started vaporizing the jet fuel, it would slowly spread over the pond. Sure, I see. <coughs> but uh, uh, that, uh, that was always an interesting thing. People say, oh, we got to spill the jet fuel, call the fire department. Yeah, it was. Go get a bucket of water. <laughs> throw a bucket of water. <laughs> and so uh, those were some of the, the changes that occurred, the, the uh, technology changes. Uh, the de-icing of aircraft changed drastically. <clears throat> a a DC-3 could sit out there and it could have snow on its wings and tails no problem, fire up the engine and go. Uh, we could have uh, four inches of snow on the runway. The DC-3, go. DC-6 wasn't much different. We tried to keep it down to two inches of snow. With the jets, uh, a Boeing 707 will never get off the ground if there's a half an inch of slush on a runway. That slush creates enough drag on the wheels and being thrown back on the fuselage 
that it will never get off the ground, no matter how long the runway. Consequently, as we saw more and more corporate jet activity, uh, our requirements on snow removal is went up. So then instead of using just plows, we had to use a runway sweeper, 14 foot wide. So when the plows were, were done, and they would leave a little bit on the runway, mm -hmm. the sweeper had to sweep it off. And when we went to the 150 foot wide runway, pretty soon that windrow you were developing got pretty high before you got to the edge of the runway. So now we're in the area of the snow blowers. The snow blowers could throw the snow 150 feet. And our first one uh, could move about 3,000 tons an hour. Uh, the one we eventually had ran about 5,000 tons an hour. And we would form what was called a conga line. Two snow plows, one plowing over, the other one picking up his, and behind them a sweeper sweeping over and behind the sweeper, the blower. And they just go down the runway. Uh, it would still take us a good hour and a half to clear this runway for jet operations. <clears throat> and uh, of course the technology just kept changing all the time. Mm -hmm. People say, why don't you just go out and put salt? Well, salt and aluminum don't mix. If your regular road salt got on an aircraft, eventually it would corrode the aluminum. Mm -hmm. And I would tell people, you know, it doesn't look good, but it's embarrassing when a wing falls off. Uh, and that's what could happen. Sure. Uh, so, while the highway crews could use a de-icer down to uh, maybe uh, 20, 22 degrees, we were forced to use urea, which was a farm fertilizer, but it had a high percentage of nitrogen in it. But it was only good down to maybe 29, 30 degrees. So its use was marginal. Uh, the thing we had to do with that was when we had a forecast and it looked like those snow clouds coming in, we had to lay the urea down right now and hope we weren't wasting it and it was going to snow to prevent that pavement ice bond. Because if that wasn't there to prevent that bond, uh, you just had to go out there and just pound that ice to get it off. So that was, that was a whole different technology that developed over the years for airports. Um, there were, we had one snowfall, I think it was 78. The 78 one, oh. Yeah. Uh, it locked down the city and locked down Indianapolis and it was something. Actually, the, the governor was up in his airplane flying from Indianapolis to Chicago. And we were proud to announce that the governor announced that the only bare pavement he saw between Indianapolis and Chicago was a runway at Purdue University. <laughs> <laughs> but we sat for 36 hours waiting to get out and do some work. I'd send one of the guys out in the truck and he'd go out about 200 feet and turn around and he couldn't see his snow tracks. And he'd find something and he'd come back to the garage. And uh, so we just sat there. Uh, we, had, uh, we had cots uh, and we had the coffee pot going. We didn't have any food. Uh, but we had a pass for the union building. So the guys got on the snowblower 
and we took the snowblower to the Union Building to eat or pick up sandwiches to bring back to the airport. Was, excuse me, was the restaurant closed at that by that time? Remember, there used to be a restaurant at the airport? It, it, uh, yes, it, it, it yes, had, it was see, closed by now. I, when I first came here, we used to go out there for lunch, but it had since yeah. closed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we pick up sandwiches for the guys in the tower. Sure. And, uh, you know, but uh, I think people looked at it as kind of funny going down State Street with a snowblower. <laughs> you're lucky you're and, and not moving any snow. <laughs> uh, mm. uh, actually, uh, Fred Ford called me and said, we've got a basketball game. And State Street will probably be passable, but there's a huge drift in front of that fraternity house uh, uh, down there on Northwestern. He said, can you get it? I said, yes, Fred, we can. However, you realize that anything is in that snow drift is going to be chewed up and thrown away. I said, we can hope there are no students buried in the snowdrift. We can hope there are no cars in that snowdrift. And I said, we will throw that snow 150 feet off to the side. He said, let me get back to you. <laughs> well, he got a hold of foggers and they had a huge uh, front bucket and they, could do it they took care of it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I explained to Fred, I said, you know, we've got good equipment out here, but it's not civilized. It's not for that kind of job. I said, I can go down 3rd Street and knock out every window in the residence halls on either side. He said, yeah, I know. Yeah. Man. Me. We're going to have to stop for a minute. Um,